Good morning. It is wonderful to see you all this morning and to be in worship together. Happy Mother's Day to you, uh, to all of you who are mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers and mothers to many people, whether you have children or not, those who have uh, been that nurturing presence in the lives of, uh, of kids. Uh, happy Mother's Day to you too, and uh, so glad to be in worship together this morning. Let me announce um, a couple of pieces of good news. One is today is the first Sunday when our children are back in children's programming at 9.30 and 11. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and so uh, pre-registration is required for that uh, for obvious reasons in terms of planning and, and safety. But the kids will be um, leaving with Mr. Mark and others uh, who are helping out uh, at, at, uh, after the children's moment. Mr. Mark will give instructions about, about all that. The second piece of good news, I feel like saying, where's Mr. Mark? Over here. There you are. I feel like saying, number two, <laughs> number two. Uh, number two, a uh, good piece of uh, news is that according to CDC guidelines, if you are uh, fully vaccinated and wearing a mask, you can sing. And I can't tell you how wonderful that is. Uh, I know it's been hard not to sing, and, and uh, you've probably sung a few times uh, anyway, but now to be able to do that is such a blessing, and, um, and we, celebrate, we celebrate that. So we're making progress. Uh, thank you for wearing your mask uh, still while we are together. Remember, not everyone is vaccinated, and that's the safe uh, practice for us. There is uh, access to the worship bulletin with this QR code that you will find on this card in the pew in front of you. Uh, so you can find the worship bulletin there. All the responses will be up on the screens, uh, too. And so you can see those as well. If you're worshiping with us at home, welcome. So glad that you are a part of this service. Happy Mother's Day to you as well. Glad that we're together in this way. And I invite you at home to prepare your worship space, uh, to light a candle in the space where you're worshiping and to prepare your space as we are lighting candles here in the sanctuary, bringing in symbolically the light of Christ into this place. Then I invite you to do the same thing. Today, on our, in our worship space, as part of our series Sanctuary, when we are talking about the images uh, and uh, the, the pictures, stained glass window, all the images and symbols in the sanctuary, and uh, what they mean for us and how they speak to us, we're also thinking about those worship spaces at home and what they mean and, and how they speak. And uh, so Jim and Linda Abel have provided their worship materials from their house. Uh, the Bible that was Jim's ordination Bible. He's a retired United Methodist uh, pastor. A cross that was given to them uh, for their 51st, no, 50th wedding anniversary. Tomorrow is 51. No, 52. Okay, I'll get it right in a minute. Uh, tomorrow's 50, happy anniversary, by the way, to the Abels. And uh, a special candle that has three wicks reminding us of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you for sharing uh, that with us uh, today. Now let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Well, friends here in the sanctuary, it's fun to be able to ask you to stand now for our call to worship. In a moment, you'll see the words to the call on the screens here. Uh, the QR code that Dr. B talked about a moment ago, you'll find uh, the words there. And at home, on your device, I love the way the words magically appear. So let's join together now in our call to worship. Jesus gives the invitation to every person. Come to me, follow me, be my disciples. As his disciples, we worship and praise God. So beautiful to hear your voices. If you would now join me as we affirm our faith together, the words of the affirmation of faith will appear on the screens behind me or in front of me if you're watching online. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Christ, baptism is a sign of God's mercy and love, reminding us that we do not come into relationship with God on the basis of anything we know, but rather on the basis of God's gracious invitation to us. Children have always had an important place among the people of God. Remember the words of Jesus, how he said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for it is such as these belong to the kingdom of God. And I ask you now as you stand before God in this congregation, do you affirm your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? Yes. And will you nurture Kellen Parish in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Yes. All right. Kellen Parish, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now if you'll place your hands on him also. Kellen Parish, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Now you can see your new church family. What a blessing it is to participate in this holy sacrament of baptism. And, uh, and we do that by pledging ourselves along with his parents that we'll do everything that we can to uphold and care for Kellen uh, as he grows up among us, uh, helping him to know the things of God so that he'll come to the place in his own life where he'll stand at this or some other altar and make his own profession of faith in Christ. And this is all God's wonderful gift offered to us without price. And because of this gift, we now have an opportunity to enthusiastically join in our congregational response. With God's, With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that God faith and confirm and strengthen in the way that leads to life eternal. Amen. Well, good morning, friends. Okay, so you get to sing. So we're gonna sing probably for the next 20 children's messages because that is like the main tool in my toolkit and I haven't been able to use it for a year. So you're, it's all gonna come out now. This is a classic song that we would typically sing in the children's wing and it goes like this. Doing what's right isn't always easy, isn't always easy, isn't always easy. Doing what's right isn't always easy, but it's always, always right. There's like four words in the whole song. You think you got it? <laughs> Let's try it together. Here we go. Doing what's right isn't always easy, isn't always easy, isn't always easy. Doing what's right isn't always easy, but it's always, always right. And there's something missing. At the very end of the song, the kids would really be upset with me if we did not add cha-cha-cha. <laughs> Which cha-cha-cha is like the amen of childhood. So let's try it again and let's add the cha-cha-cha. Here we go. Doing what's right isn't always easy, isn't always easy, isn't always easy. Doing what's right isn't always easy, but it's always, always right. Cha-cha-cha. That's a good cha-cha-cha-cha. So the prophets of the Old Testament, they knew this because God would sometimes call people to be prophets, to go and tell God's people what to do and how to behave. And people often don't like being told what to do. 
And so sometimes the prophets, they pretended like they didn't even hear God or they gave God excuses or sometimes, like in the case of Jonah, ran the other direction. Of course, God catches up with Jonah because those prophets knew you can be prophetic or you can be popular, but it's really hard to be both. But eventually they said yes and did what God told them to do in spite of the fact that, let's all sing together, doing what's right isn't always easy, isn't always easy, isn't always easy. Doing what's right isn't always easy, but it's always, always right. Cha-cha-cha. Even in the New Testament, Jesus called 12 people to be his disciples, close friends and helpers to go throughout and teach how to be kind people, to heal and to share and to love. What could sound better than that? Doesn't that sound amazing? Doesn't that sound wonderful? Can you imagine if Jesus called us right now like the actual flesh and blood person Jesus called? Who, who could say no to that? Except there were a lot of people in power when Jesus was on the earth. And they, they felt pretty threatened by people saying that everyone should be loved and that the poorest and the most humble should be lifted up and that every person who had been treated like an outsider should be treated like an insider. And so those people with power made it very dangerous for Jesus and his friends. It was hard but they followed him anyway because they knew that doing what's right isn't always easy, isn't always easy, isn't always easy. Doing what's right isn't always easy, but it's always, always right. Cha-cha-cha. And so fast forward to us. Here we are right now in this moment. And for 14 months, it's been really, really hard because we know to follow God. We know to follow Jesus. And we believe it's important to follow health experts who tell us when it's okay to reopen and when it's okay to sing. And we're like, now? Can we do it now? Not yet. Now? Now? Can we do it now? Not yet. And we feel the, the, the anxiety and the desire to be back together. And can we tell you, those of us that work here in the church, it is really hard to say no to the people we love. That is really, really hard. It is not easy, especially when other churches would be opening and people go, now, now? I'm like, well, not yet. We're thinking about maybe coming in and being masked and sitting six feet apart. That's a start. But here we are. Things keep getting better. I mean, we're singing. We're singing with masks on, but we're singing. Can I tell you how hard that is for me? My nostrils are huge. Every time I take in a breath, I feel like my whole mask is gonna go up. Doing what's right is very difficult in this case, but we're taking those steps little by little, and we are just so excited every time we get to take a step, always with an eye and a heart towards doing what's right so that we can live into the true word of sanctuary, which means safe place for the people we love. Doing what's right isn't always easy, isn't always easy, isn't always easy. Doing what's right isn't always easy, but it's always, always right. Cha, cha, cha. And speaking of things that are not easy, we are about to endeavor into bringing children to the children's wing in just a second. I have never done this before. Opened in-person Sunday school during the end of a pandemic. This is a first. So here's how it's going to work, because we want to take as many of the safety protocols as possible. My goal is to do two things, keep the Jesus in them and keep the COVID out of them. And the rest is just gravy. So kids, if you look down, if you have a green name tag, if your name tag has green on it, I want you to come right over here with your green teachers and your green teachers are gonna take you so anybody with green, come on down with excitement like you just got called and the price is right. Mr. Mark, what's the price is right? All right, come on green friends. Good, and go line up with the green teachers and green teachers will take you right out into the hall. Try and stay a good arm's length apart from each other. We'll see how well this works in the children's wing. Knock, knock. 
Orange. Orange, you glad you get to come up now and be with Mr. Mark? All of my orange friends, come on, you're stuck with me. And this is probably the, the most unceremonious exit of all time, but see y'all in about 45 minutes. Wouldn't it lovely to see the children getting to go to their classes today? And I invite you now, if you have your Bible with you, or the words will be on the screen as we read our gospel lesson today, which will be found in Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. During that time, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night long. At daybreak, he called together his disciples. He chose 12 of them, whom he called apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, his brother Andrew, and James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called a zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. So much, Reverend Phyllis. Let's do a lightning round right now, the announcement lightning round. Regardless of whether this is your first time with us or you are a longtime worshiper, we welcome all of you today. We are thrilled that you're here. Let's begin with our friends at home, our virtual friends. You may be doing a number of things, a podcast. You may be on YouTube. If you're on Facebook Live, I hope you'll chat with Donna Smith. She would be loved to visit with you this morning. And for those of you who are live streaming, on behalf of Lisa Helm, our Director of Welcoming Ministries, I want to thank you in advance for giving us your email address, for giving us your cell phone. Uh, Lisa and I will not abuse that. We will protect your information. We want to help you be connected. We want to help all of you be connected with what we call Worship Plus One. And so we look forward to to reaching out to you, to thanking you, and to giving you an opportunity to be a part of, that, of whatever you would like to uh, here at the church. Uh, yes? Can you have a moment, please? They can't hear you up there. Okay. I will be glad to do that. How's this? Do I sound even better here? <laughs> Excellent. Paul, thank you so much. Well, let's, speaking of the pulpit, let's focus on you here in the sanctuary right now. Thank you so much for singing with gusto. Thank you for being here. And if you're a new family with us this morning, I want to ask you to come and receive a gift. We have a gift for you. At the end of the service, if you go out uh, the back of the sanctuary and just out into the garden a, a bit, you'll see a sign for on-ramp. And there in Wesley Hall, we have gifts for adults and children, for those of you who are new with us. And so please, we would love to give those to you, to say good morning to you. Uh, so gosh, thank you so much for being here today. For everyone, your generous giving continues to make such a difference. And for those of you here in the sanctuary, you can use these black boxes that are at the, the close to every exit today. Also, for everyone, you're always welcome to go on our website, which is uh, fumcfw.org backslash give. And that's an opportunity for you to continue to make a difference for others. Nancy Fisher wrote a great article this week on how you're doing that in terms of our Next 90 campaign. And so we simply want to thank you for that. 
And now, let's prepare ourselves for the offertory by having a word of prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, for all these gifts, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the ways that you draw us together. We give you thanks for blessing us to be blessed for others. And we give you thanks for the love of Christ. Amen. Thank you so much, Choral Union, for that beautiful music. And thank you, congregation, for your beautiful music. Wonderful to hear everyone sing this morning. We're in our series, Sanctuary, when we are um, once again discovering the treasures that are found throughout uh, this beautiful space, uh, the symbols, the images that communicate to us without words that remind us of important truths and that remind us of, uh, of the people uh, that have lived the faith who have gone before us. And so today, uh, our theme is inspiration and how we are inspired by those who've gone before us. And we're particularly thinking about the apostles. But we're also thinking this morning on this Mother's Day about all the women who have had a big impact in our lives. Uh, in Scripture, in the Old and New Testaments, Hebrew Scriptures, the New Testament, uh, in both places we find images of God uh, and of, of uh, Jesus in the case of the New Testament that are images both of mothers and fathers. Because the God um, 
is like the, the most loving parent we can imagine, uh, one who loves us unconditionally, uh, one who gives and gives and gives, grace upon grace, as the Gospel of John says in the first chapter. And so today on this Mother's Day, we celebrate mothers and grandmothers, great-grandmothers, those who are like mothers to us, those who have lived out that and reflected the love of God, and we give thanks for that. We also think about the apostles. We heard a moment ago the passage of Scripture that is Jesus naming his apostles. And in our sanctuary, we find the shields or the symbols uh, for the apostles. They're found up in the middle of these openings here uh, that are openings at the front of the pipe organ. Uh, we have six on this side, six of those shields on this side, and then in the center, symbols for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, symbols of the Trinity in the middle. But each of these shields says something about the life of that particular apostle, and more often than not about the death of that particular apostle, their martyrdom in many cases. And so, you know, you can look at the shields and you find uh, Simon Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip Bartholomew, and you can just go all the way around and see those images there. And they remind us of the lives of these people. And they remind us that these are people who lived out their faith in a certain way and had leadership in the church and, and shared their faith and gave of themselves in many cases, most cases, even giving their lives for the faith. The apostles. Now, sometimes we call them the disciples, the 12 disciples. Um, sometimes they're simply called the 12. We find this language in Scripture, but there is a difference between disciple and apostle. Those words are not synonyms. Disciples are learners. And so all the followers of Jesus are disciples. And by the time Jesus names these apostles, he has dozens of disciples who are often with him and following him and listening to his teaching, men and women who have devoted themselves to Jesus. But after a full night of prayer up on a mountain, Jesus calls these 12 to be apostles. Now, the word apostle means one who is sent. And it's a very unusual word. It's a rare word in Greek. It's only used a few times, relatively few times outside of Scripture. It's mostly used in talking about sending a ship with cargo or passengers. That ship is sent, and so it is an apostle. Apostolos is the Greek word. Only rarely is it ever used of a person. In fact, there are only three instances scholars have identified outside the New Testament where that's used. But this word for a person, but this word was adopted by the early Christian church, the word apostolos, those who are sent. And it had a particular meaning for these particular 12. And so it became kind of an office in the church. There were the 12 apostles. And then there were other apostles that would follow. We know that uh, Paul called himself an apostle. And it was controversial. He says in his own writings, uh, some questioned his apostleship because he never walked with Jesus. He never followed Jesus during Jesus' earthly ministry. And so Paul called himself an apostle because he was sent by the risen Christ as a missionary. But Paul also greeted people as uh, an apostle. In the last chapter of Romans, when he greets people that he knows in Rome, a church he's never visited, uh, he greets someone named Junia, a woman whom he calls an apostle of the Lord. So there were other apostles. But it's not the same as disciples. Apostles are those who are sent. And the thing about this group of apostles is that they are an unlikely bunch 
to be together. But they're ordinary folks. There's no one prominent among the group, no one powerful among this group. They're just ordinary people. In that sense, they're just like you and me, just ordinary folks. And they're also a, a diverse group of people. Uh, let me give you a couple ex of examples. Take Simon the Zealot, not Simon Peter, but Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector. These are two people who in any other setting would be enemies. See, Matthew, as a tax collector, was seen as a traitor, sold out to Rome, part of that corrupt system of taxation that uh, the tax collectors would enrich themselves on the backs of the poorest of the poor uh, through that corrupt system, and the tax collectors were hated. They were seen as traitors sold out to Rome. And then there's Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were people who believed that the Roman Empire needs to be overthrown, kicked out of Judea. And it needs to be done by violent means. And so this group called the Zealots um, were, saw themselves as super patriots. And it may be that Simon the Zealot, who believed, who hated uh, anyone who was a Roman, anyone who sympathized with the Romans, any tax collector that was part of that corrupt system, it may be that Simon the Zealot was even uh, a dagger bearer, Sicarii they were called. Uh, they carried these curved daggers hidden in their robes and they would get into a crowd and they would use that dagger to assassinate a Roman or a Roman sympathizer or somebody like Matthew, a tax collector. And just imagine when Jesus called these two to be apostles and that they would travel together and they would be around the campfire together and they would be sometimes sleeping outside together. I imagine that Matthew slept with one eye open for a while with Simon the Zealot over there someplace. But here they are, both followers of Jesus. Simon the Zealot who believes in the, in the uh, violent overthrow of Rome who has to come to terms with Jesus who he knows hates injustice as much as the zealots do, but he has a completely different way of dealing with that, a completely different understanding of a kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. It's where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And here they are, both followers of Jesus. It's astounding. Both transformed into new people individually and into new ways of relating to one another and to the world. That's just two of them. You have, you have Simon Peter, Simon Peter the fisherman. Simon Peter, someone has said that Simon Peter only opened his mouth to change feet. <laughs> I mean, he was always speaking before he thought. He was jumping out there and saying something arguing with Jesus at just the wrong time. Simon Peter got the nickname from Jesus because of this tremendous uh, affirmation of faith. When Jesus asked the question, who do you say that I am? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I tell you, you are Peter. And in the Greek, that name Petros is a play on the word Petra, which means rock, solid, sturdy. That's a nickname that Simon Peter certainly had to live into because he was mostly anything but that. That's Simon Peter. And then there are James, there's James and John, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, they're the other two that Jesus gave a nickname to. Did you know that? They're the sons of, they're usually called James and John, the sons of Zebedee. But in the Gospel of Mark, it says that Jesus nicknamed them the sons of thunder. Don't you know they were characters <laughs> to get that nickname from Jesus? 
I mean, they were always ready to act and think later. They were also fishermen, probably pretty rough around the edges. Uh, they, uh, they, well, here's an example. They're in Samaria, and they're in a village, and Jesus proclaims the good news, and the village rejects him. And what do these sons of thunder want to do? They want to call down fire from heaven to consume the village. They haven't quite gotten the message of the nature of Jesus yet. The sons of thunder. Th these are the guys that, uh, after Jesus has just said that he will suffer and be crucified, he'll be put to death. And, and these guys say, huh, okay, uh, Jesus, will you do something for us? What do you ask? Will you grant that one of us sit at your right hand and one at your left hand when you come into your kingdom? Really? I mean, is that the right time? One commentator said it's like someone just told you that they have a week to live and your response is, huh, can I have your car? <laughs> so these sons of thunder. But here's the fascinating thing. Simon Peter lives into that nickname, Petros, Petra, rock. And he becomes one of the primary leaders of the early church. And then James and John, the writings in their name, that bear their name in the New Testament, James is, you know, the, 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 these these writings and the stories about them that circulate following their deaths all have to do with love. John's called the apostle of love. It has to do with courage and living out the faith and these sons of thunder uh, were transformed. Well, you also have Andrew, who was always bringing people to meet Jesus. Philip, uh, who was this very practical person. Uh, when Jesus uh, saw that there was a multitude of people, 5,000 people, uh, who were hungry, he said uh, to Philip, where are we going to get the food to feed all these people? And that's why Philip's shield has a couple of loaves of bread on it on either side of the cross. Um, just that one conversation, Philip's response is, Lord, eight months' wages wouldn't be enough to feed all these people. And then he witnessed this miracle that occurred where everybody had plenty and then some. So that's Philip, very practical. You know, the one who says, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> Can you identify with any of these people? These were just folks, people who were called to be sent apostles. Fascinating, isn't it? Thomas, we're the ones that gave Thomas the unfortunate nickname Doubting Thomas. It's nowhere mentioned there. But Thomas is this person who just needs, well, he's kind of a skeptic. And he's a reasonable person. And he needs to experience things for himself. Does that sound like any of us here? I think it does. The only nickname Thomas has is Thomas the Twin. So here we are. All these ordinary people, this diverse group of people who um, are like the church. They're each individuals with their own gifts and graces and their own perspectives and their own opinions. But we come together as a church and we're bound together in Christ at the center. And when we're surrounded by these images on Sunday morning, we remember how many different people there are in the church and how we're all bound together in Christ. I love Frederick Beekner's image of the church. He says, we're like guests at a wedding party. And uh, we're, we're friends in the sense that we're friends of the bride and groom, but we're a little bit suspicious of each other because we really don't know each other, but we, 
we know that we're loved by the bride and groom, and we know that we love the bride and groom, and that's what brings us together. And then we become friends. But it's that love that brings us together. I love that image of the church. It's the same for those, dis those disciples who became apostles. So disciples are learners, followers of Jesus. But that word apostle is still intriguing to me. Those who are sent. And in the literal sense of the word apostle, we are all apostles. Now, please don't go out and tell people that your pastor ordained you an apostle in the service this morning. That will not get you anywhere, I promise. But that's not what I mean. It's not that office of apostle that Paul occupied and these folks did, or Junia. But, but it's the literal meaning. We are those who are sent, called out to serve to go and be God's people in the world. We say it every Sunday. Apostles, those who are sent, those who are called. This, uh, this last week, uh, a wonderful story emerged in our congregation. Uh, Marsha Ammons received, she's a longtime member of the church. Uh, Marsha's sitting back in the back with her husband, John. Longtime members of the church, and uh, Marsha received a, a Facebook message. And it goes back to her call to be one who is sent more than 30 years ago. There used to be, very close to the church, a public housing uh, unit called Ripley Arnold. And those of you who've been, here, who've been here for a long time know what I'm talking about. It predates me, but I've heard a lot about the ministries of this church in that place. Uh, Sandy Smith was operating um, along with those that she had recruited or called to be a part of this outreach ministry of the church, was operating out of, of the Justin building. It was then called Epworth Hall. And uh, going and, and uh, distributing, uh, as people had need, distributing uh, groceries or other, uh, f fulfilling other needs uh, in Ripley Arnold, but also had organized um, a campfire girls unit at Ripley Arnold. And she approached Marsha to recruit her to lead that unit. Now, Marsha already had a campfire girls unit in West Fort Worth. And uh, Marsha said that um, she didn't know anything about um, what it would be like to work in, in a public housing unit. Marsha, John and Marsha don't have any children, and she said, I don't know if I can take on even more of somebody else's children. But uh, Sandy Smith was very persistent. Twisted her arm, in fact. Kind of reminds me a little bit of that conversation between Moses and God where Moses argues back and forth with God. That's just like us too, isn't it? But she agreed to do it, and, uh, and she began to lead that unit. And, and she will tell you that it was a wonderful experience. And, I, and, and, and what surfaced this this week is this uh, Facebook message. Marcia said that during those years of uh, doing that ministry, she would often ask, now see if this doesn't sound familiar to you, it certainly does to me, that question, am I really making a difference? I mean, am I, is God really using me to make a difference in the life of someone else? And, uh, and this is one of those messages that comes back sometimes to, uh, to remind us that we, we just don't know the effect that we have. And so I want to read this message to you, and I'm going to um, uh, leave out last names and, and some of the names and a little bit of the detail. But. Marcia, hello, my name is Monica. 
You may not remember me, but I've always wanted to go back home to Fort Worth and thank you and a few of my teachers for exposing me to a different world outside of the Ripley Arnold public housing downtown. Then she names uh, who her mother was and her sister and brother. And then she says, please know, I understand now that God sent you to us at a time we needed you. I'm grateful and appreciative of the time and experiences you gave me. Just know, you may not remember me, but I will always remember you. Have a wonderful and blessed day. And there's a picture that Marcia shared that she posted of those girls. Uh, Marcia said, uh, you know, we didn't have children. And I didn't know if I wanted to take on more of someone else's. See, Marcia's one of those people. Marcia, you're a mother to many. And you've had an impact, clearly. But listen, in that literal sense, that's a story of being an apostle, of going out to be God's people in the world. These images remind us not only of them, but the call of God on our lives as well. Thanks be to God. Amen. God of love, source of mercy and compassion, weave your dream for the world into the fabric of our lives. Remove the scales from our eyes and lift the indifference from our hearts so that we may see your vision, a new reign of justice and compassion that will renew the earth. Transform our lives so that we may accomplish your purpose. Anoint us with your spirit of love, that we might bring good news to the oppressed, bind up the brokenhearted, and proclaim release to the captive. Give us a new urgency and a new commitment to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, and visit those who live in isolation. Help us to reach out to those who no one else will see, no one else will touch, to accept the unacceptable and to embrace the enemy. Surround us with your love, fill us with your grace, and strengthen us for your service. Empower us to respond to the call of Jesus to deny ourselves to take up our crosses to follow. Make us your apostles. And now we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
we come to the end of our time of worship together today, just a reminder that every one of those inspiring stories of the people who have shields in the sanctuary and the people who are a testimony to God's faithfulness in and amongst us, every one of those journeys began with an invitation. Come and see. And so I want to extend the same invitation to you to come and see whether you're considering becoming a Christian or making a profession of faith or being baptized or whether you just want to become a part of this portion of the body of Christ, this congregation, come and see. Our director of hospitality and welcome ministries is Lisa Helm. Her contact information will come up on the screen. She's your guide. She's your entrance. Whether you want to know more about what it is to be a Christian, to join a church, or just how to find your people in this place, let us connect Come and see the work that's being done in and through this place. And now, let us all stand together and sing our final hymn, Go and Make of All Disciples. to uh, remind the parents before our uh, benediction to, if your uh, child has gone to Sunday school, be sure and stay in place uh, following the benediction uh, so that they can find you. Uh, don't go off and leave them. <laughs> our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.